Well, good morning, everyone. One more time. Well, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you guys. It's truly always a blessing to be here. Uh, Mikey is one of my dearest friends. Love that guy a lot. Any of you guys in here who are in the student ministry? Yeah, Mikey's great. See me afterwards. I'll tell you some stories. You can get under his skin a bit. But no, Mike's one of my dearest friends, and I love Pete. I look up to him a lot. So it's great for me to be here. As Pete said a little bit earlier, uh, I identify pretty much as a Quaker, right? I, I would say that I became a Quaker probably, probably around 2011. I was in a class at Malone where I went to college called the Quakers. And we came to a meeting house that was actually right around here. It was on, yeah, it was in Salem. And we're at the Salem meeting house. And I had never been east of 62 in my entire life. So for the first time, I went east of 62. We came out here to the Quaker meeting house. And it was, for me, a completely different religious experience than I had ever had. I come from, like, black Pentecostalism. So uh, religious experience for me involves, like, shouting and yelling and dancing. But in the Quaker meeting house, we walked in, and they explained to us that we would be engaging in silent worship. And they told us, we're going to sit in silence, and we're going to wait for the Holy Spirit to move us. And if anyone's moved by the Spirit and wants to speak, feel free to get up and feel free to speak. Feel free to share what the Spirit is uh, inspiring you and moving you to say. And man, we sat in silence for about 45 minutes. I don't think I'd ever been that quiet in my entire life. But man, did I feel the Holy Ghost. I'm talking, I'm having this experience. I just felt the spirit. And afterwards, everyone went outside and they were kind of getting a tour of the meeting house. And man, I just sat there because I just like had this experience. Man, did I feel God's spirit. And as I'm sitting there, this, this small lady, this small older lady comes up to me and she grabs my hand and she leads me to a spot in the Quaker meeting house. She opens up a compartment, and then she shows me that this was, a, this was a marker and a stop on the Underground Railroad that helped slaves escape to Canada for freedom. And she began to tell me the story of the Quaker Meeting House, and she just looked up at me and she said, you're safe here. You're safe here. And I think that was the day that I pretty much, I pretty much became a Quaker. So yeah, it's great to be here. It's great to be with you guys. Excited to share in God's Word. Excited to finish up the Sightline series, the Sightline series. So with that, if you would please with me, let's turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. We are going to start in verse 13. And we'll read down to 21. We'll go from 13 to 21 today in Mark chapter 10. And you can turn to that uh, in your Bibles or with your electronic devices. And when you get that, if you could please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Starting in verse 13. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. One more time. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. And he said to them, let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For such belongs the kingdom of God. And truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms, and he blessed them laying hands on them. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except for God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. Again, teacher, all of these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go and sell all, go and sell all that you have given, all that you have, and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. Verse 22. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This is God's word, and this is true. You may be seated. A 
about 15 years ago, I was a junior in high school. And when I was a junior in high school, I played football. Now, I came from a neighborhood that is right in the middle of a tri-city area in Akron. So it's right in the middle of Akron, Coventry, and Barberton. So where I live at, it actually has no school, where I lived at, actually has no school district. We could go to either of the schools that we wanted to go to. But there was something unique about where I lived at. You see, where I lived at was uh, the neighborhood that no one essentially wanted to live in. It was a neighborhood that was filled with Section 8 housing. It was a neighborhood that had a trailer park in it. It was a neighborhood that is known to many people as the, uh, one of the dark spots of Summit County, I'll say that. Uh, yeah, for better use of words. No one wants to live in the neighborhood that I grew up in, Snyder Town, where I came from. Now, high schools, the three high schools around, love Snyder Town. Because in Snyder Town, there were individuals like me who all we did all day long, our whole lives, was play sports. We didn't have anything else to do, so we went to the Boys and Girls Club and we played sports all year round, all the time. I'm talking, we were out in the snow like playing football. It was just kind of all we had to do. We had nothing else to do, so we played a lot of sports. So, we all decided that we were going to go to Barberton. The guy who ran our Boys and Girls Club was a Barberton magic, and he taught us about the magics and the history that they had, so we all wanted to go to Barberton. Well, the guys who came before me, there was just one issue, one slight problem. None of them were eligible to ever play sports. They had really bad grades. So they basically came down to the middle school and they told one of our teachers, hey, if you can tutor these guys and you can get them to a point where they have a certain GPA, we can win some football games. And listen, in Barber, winning football games is important. It's like Texas, I don't know why, but like winning a football game is really important. So our teacher tutored us in middle school and she actually tutored us all through high school and she stuck with us and she's like, you guys are gonna win football games. So what happened was we went to high school and we were pretty decent. We started winning some football games and we started winning to the point to when I was a junior, there were talks of us winning the state championship, the division one state championship, right? So. Basically, what happened is, we have a coach, we love him a lot, Coach Stats. He's our friend, we like this guy, he's younger, he listens to the kind of music we listen to. He's wonderful. Good old Coach Stats. Well, later on we found out that Coach Stats like, didn't want to coach us anymore because we were kind of miserable. Miserable young people, but we get a new coach. And this coach, when I say he was an older guy, I literally mean he was an older guy. Coach Glaze, when he started coaching us, was 73 years old, coaching high school football. Now, he had been a high school coach in Barberton who had won a lot. So he heard that there were some young guys who were pretty good at football, so he said, I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna coach these guys. Now, the coach we had before let us do whatever we wanted. He's like, as long as you guys score touchdowns, do whatever you want. So that means that we had about 30 minute practices, we get to the games, and we kind of like called our own plays. Like he would call plays, but we'd say, ah, we don't want to do that. So we kind of like improvised. It was like jazz improv, only being on the football field. So that's what was happening. Coach Glaze came and all. Coach Glaze was old school. We practiced for an hour and a half. We did a lot of running. And what he would say to us constantly, posture, boys, posture. It all comes down to your posture. You practice how you play. Posture, boys. And then he would grab myself. I played running back, and he'd grab our quarterback by our face mask, and he'd look at us, and he'd say, posture, boys, you could be great, but you don't have any discipline. You don't have any discipline. So what happened was that year, we went in the game, and we do what we always did. But this year, we were juniors, and we were a little bit bigger, and a little bit faster, and a little bit stronger. So we started putting up basketball scores on the football field. We started blowing people out. We were scoring 60 and 70 points on people. It was wonderful. It got to the point where by the end of the season, we were 10 and up. And every game at halftime, good old Coach Glaze, he put his hat down. And we'd be up by 30, 40 points at halftime. He put his hat down, and he never smiled at halftime. After the games were winning, he never smiled. 
He looked at us and simply said, posture, boys, posture, posture, boys. And why is he saying that? Well, he would say that because I would take the football at running back, and he'd say, James, put two hands on the football, posture, son. But I never would. I'd go through the hole, and I'd hold the ball like it was a friend. And sometimes I'd get hit, but never that hard. So I'd hold the ball out here, and I'd do showboaty stuff, and I'd get to the end zone, and I'd start jogging before I got there. He'd come to the sidelines, and he'd just put his hat down and posture, boys. My friend Trey, still my dear friend till this day, Trey was a great quarterback. I'm talking he had a big arm. He never threw the ball. And Coach Glaze would say, three-step drop, throw that football, you score a touchdown. Now he'd just take off and run. Over the course of the season, he probably threw the ball 21 times. He'd just run. And we scored a lot of touchdowns because he couldn't catch us. So every game, he'd look at us and say, posture, boys, posture. You practice how you play. Poor posture equals poor practice. Poor practice equals a poor product. But we look at him and you say, what do you mean poor product? We're winning. We're undefeated, dude. So then the playoffs came. And he gathered us up and he said, boys, I really need you to do what's in the game plan. I really need you to have good posture. I really need you to point yourselves and put yourselves in the direction to win. Uh, to make a really long story short, the first two games of the playoffs, we did the same thing. We started winning, and then we faced a team called Cincinnati Christian. Cincinnati Christian was a team that was uh, smaller than us. Cincinnati Christian was a team that uh, looked like we were going to roll them over. I got off the bus, and I was like, here we go. I was like, this is a career day. I just remember getting off the bus like, ah, we're about to blow them out, blow them out of the water. Well, Cincinnati Christian had a really good coach. And Cincinnati Christian had players that actually followed the game plan. You see, they had watched a whole lot of film against us, and they knew that if they did a few things, they could beat us. You see, what they did was they said, hey, the quarterback never throws, and this guy never follows the hole. He just tries to beat people to the outside. So you see, what they did was they put 10 people in the box. And every time I grabbed the ball, there were three people in front of me, and there was nowhere to go. And these guys actually knew how to tackle. So what happened was one of them would hit me, and the other one would strip the ball. I fumbled four times in the first half. Four times in the first half. We would go on to beat Cincinnati Christian, but in the next game, man, what we did to most teams got done to us because people watched film on that game, and they came the next game, and literally they played with no safeties. Everyone was in a box, and we lost. And for the first time all season, after that game, Coach Blaze smiled. <laughs> after 13 straight wins, for the first time, Grandpa Old Man Glaze smiled. And he took his hat off. And he looked at us and he said, posture, boys, posture. Poor posture leads to poor practice. And poor practice renders a poor product. Posture, boys, posture. Let me put my cards on the table. That's the sermon. Posture. Poor posture leads to poor practice that renders us a poor product. You see, the book of Mark is really interesting. The book of Mark has these stories that happen right after one another. One of the key words in the book of Mark is the word immediately, and immediately. So, and immediately this happens. Jesus gets baptized, and immediately he preaches his first sermon, and immediately he goes and heals the paralytic man. And immediately he calls the disciples. And immediately he does this. This is the movement of the book of Mark. It is fast-paced. It is happening quick. But what's interesting is in this story, there is no immediate after Jesus with the children. I believe it's not fast-moving and it's not fast-paced because I believe even though seemingly what I read to you was two stories, I believe it's one story that's trying to communicate one point and it's trying to communicate one message to us. 
And that message to us is posture, son, posture. Poor posture leads to poor practice that renders us a poor product. What happens in the first move in this story? Let's talk through it. You have Jesus, who is a son of a carpenter. You have Jesus, who is from Nazareth, which is literally the wrong side of the railroad tracks. If we read the book of John, his disciples that he calls are literally, the first thing he's going to say is, can anything good come from Nazareth? Jesus is from the wrong side of the railroad tracks. Jesus and his family to flee persecution have to run to Egypt. So Jesus, for a part of his life, is identified as what we will call today a refugee. Right? But this Jesus is also, as John tells us, the God of the universe. So this Jesus is also known socially as a rabbi. And a rabbi is a teacher. A rabbi is a teacher. But a rabbi is not just any kind of teacher. A rabbi in Jewish culture is a higher up social figure. You see at the top of the social echelon of the first century, especially within Judaism, you're going to have your soldiers, you're going to have your lords, people who are dignitaries, and you're going to have your religious teachers. So they're going to be figures who are going to kind of be at the top of the totem pole, but Jesus flips the structure of this because Jesus is not taught in a synagogue his whole life. Jesus is taught to be a carpenter by his dad, Joseph. And Jesus, unlike these other religious figures, is not going to have a central place where he stands and teaches, but Jesus is going to go along and be where people are at. Jesus is going to be different than the other religious teachers because Jesus isn't going to be a figure that is unapproachable, but Jesus is going to be a figure that you literally can reach out and touch. There's a story about a woman who reaches out and touches him and is made whole. Jesus is a different kind of figure. And what you see in this story is Jesus being a different kind of figure because Jesus in this story is the only one who does something that's socially unacceptable. You see, what happens is the parents want their kids to be blessed by the teacher, to be blessed by the rabbi. This is a big deal. They want the rabbi to lay hands on them and pray for them and give them a blessing. But you see, the disciples are doing what anyone else would have done in that day. They're doing what we would have done in that day if we were there. And the disciples say to the parents, get these kids out of here. This is a rabbi. This is a teacher. This is someone who's up here. This individual doesn't have time for the kids. This individual doesn't have time to do this. How dare you bring your kids here and interrupt him who's trying to teach, who's an important figure. How dare you waste his time? But what Jesus does is Jesus, again, is going to be different. And he's going to flip the script and he's going to indignantly, as the scripture says to them, he's going to indignantly say to his disciples what he says to them lots. I rebuke you. He's going to rebuke his disciples and he's going to say, let the little ones come to me. And not only that, but he lays hands on the little ones and he blesses them. And not only that, but then he begins to teach and what he begins to teach them is a little bit different than, than what they would have known. Because you see, the most religious individuals in that day would have done their best to keep up with the over 613 laws that had been developed by that time. So the religious figures would have spent their lives trying to do those things, trying to earn their way to a religious standing. That's what would have made them religiously acceptable. But Jesus says to them, unless you enter the kingdom of heaven, like one of these, like the children, then you have no part of me. Goodness gracious. Story one, we'll come back to it. Story two is about a young rich man. So a young rich man comes up to him in the same way. Now, I want you to notice this. These stories seemingly juxtapose each other, but again, I believe they're one story. You find a young rich man. The young rich man has no problem getting into the presence of Jesus. The children do. 
This rich man has no issue or no problem at all getting in front of Jesus. Because when they look at this rich man, they say, oh, this rich man looks good, right? He looks like he should be someone who could be in the presence of this rabbi who is up here. Because he's up here. So he has no issue or no problem gaining conversation with Jesus. The disciples aren't trying to hold him back. The disciples aren't telling him to get out of here, that I don't have time for you. Hmm. But let's, let's walk through this story a little bit. And let's, let's check out Jesus' response. The young rich man asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now this is a question that is being asked often in that day. I could get into the many reasons why, but for time's sake, we'll just say these few. The Jewish people are under persecution from Rome. That's one. And two, because it's a question that we all have. It's probably a question that has brought many of us here. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And praise God, I've seen a lot of people come up for communion today, so many of us have the answer to that question. Praise God. But what must I do to inherit eternal life? Honest question, right? What must I do? Then we move on in the story. Verse 19 is interesting. In verse 19, what we're going to find is six of the Ten Commandments quoted. So what must I do to inherit eternal life? The last six of the Ten Commandments are quoted, not the first four. In the Old Testament, uh, a theologian and a, and a good old pastor named Brian Zahn is going to say that there are two Two major sins in the Old Testament. Two. Idultery and injustice. Idultery and injustice. He's going to get that from the Ten Commandments. Because what the Ten Commandments communicate to us in the first four is simply turn your eyes towards Jesus. Take hold of his wonderful grace. For the things of this world will grow faintly dim your heart towards Jesus. Have no other gods before me. Keep the Sabbath day holy. These commandments deal with our hearts towards Jesus and our relationship vertically with Jesus. The last six deal with our horizontal relationships with each other. So as people whose hearts are turned towards Jesus, the last six are saying, if your heart is for Jesus, then the way you treat other people should reflect that. So honor your father and mother. So do not lie, do not steal, do not kill. These are horizontal commandments. All of the horizontal commandments are named in this. So Jesus asks him a question that is going to point at the first four commandments. So what Jesus says to this man, this rich man who has no problem getting in the presence of Jesus, this rich man who by all appearances should be the kind of person who would talk to Jesus, what Jesus says to this man Hmm. In verse 21, what Jesus says to this man is go sell all your possessions and give them to the poor. And then you will inherit the treasure that is in heaven. Now, what I love about verse 21 is Jesus doesn't say this in a condemning way. You've learned this through sight line, I'm sure, because Jesus sees this individual Jesus sees him, just like Jesus sees the woman at the well, just like Jesus sees Nicodemus, just like Jesus sees the woman who's caught in adultery, just like Jesus sees every single one of his disciples as he calls them. Jesus sees this man, and it says that in love he asked him this question. It says that he loved him, so he's not condemning him. And let me stop and preach for a second. The God who's revealed in Jesus is not a God of condemnation. The God who is revealed in Jesus is a God who has come to save by the means of love. John 3.16, we can talk about it when it's not Easter. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should have life and life more abundantly. This is the God revealed in Jesus. This is God's desire for humanity. And verse 17 is great too, because it says that he came not to condemn the world, but to save it. 
So what Jesus says to this man is not meant to condemn him. It's not meant to cast him off. But Jesus is loving him because you see sometimes, sometimes love asks hard questions. Sometimes love is not all rainbows and roses. But Jesus loves this man enough to challenge him towards the truth. And what is the truth that he's communicating to him in this? He's asking him, son, where is your posture? Where is the posture of your heart? What he's saying to him, son, poor posture leads to poor practice. And poor practice renders a poor product. Because when Jesus asks him to sell all of his stuff, and he doesn't, and he walks away from him, What he's revealing to him is that his heart is postured in the wrong place. And because his heart is postured in the wrong place, it's going to lead to a poor product. And that poor product is going to be not inheriting the kingdom of God. And the same question that Jesus is asking that man, he is asking us, where is the posture of our heart? Where is the posture of our heart? In the first story, What we find in those children is faith. It's faith. That's what Jesus is saying. If he's saying, hey, if you're going to come and be a part of my kingdom, if you're going to be a part of my rule and reign, you're going to have to be like these children. What is he actually saying? He's saying you're going to have to have faith. Ephesians chapter 2 teaches us that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not by any works of the law. Not by any works of the law. What this rich young man is doing is he's saying, yes, I've done all of the commandments that you just named. I've done that. Christianity is not a works-based religion. We cannot do our way into the kingdom of God. We cannot Bible study our way into God's kingdom. We cannot serve the homeless enough to give ourselves right standing with God. But Jesus, in the victory of God that is displayed on the cross, has done the work for us. We cannot do any more work. We cannot do anything else. But we receive his kingdom like children. It's us having faith that he wants us in his presence. And it's us having faith that he will bless us. Dear friends, I have a two-year-old daughter. And my daughter Jada is a nut just like her dad. She's a big nut. And Jada stays with my mom three times a week. My mom's great. She, like, flipped her schedule around so we didn't have to get child care. She's wonderful. So Jada's with my mom, and I walked in two weeks ago, and I seen something that like scared me to death, right? So I walk in, and my daughter is sitting on the couch. My mom's cooking. Like she's sitting there quiet. She's two years old, so she's sitting there quietly. And ESPN is on, and she's got her sip cup like off to the side like this, and her like legs are spread out on the couch. Her other arm is down. And I walked in and I was like, hey, Jada. And she just goes, hi, daddy. And she's just like lasered in on ESPN. I tell you, I took a picture of it and I sent it to my wife. And she's like, oh my gosh, that is you. (laughs) Like, I didn't teach her to do that. She just seen me doing that. And she just naturally does it. Right? It's the best thing ever. Like, my wife cries like every time she does it. We do bedtime every night, and before we go to bed, like, I'm like hyper religious, so I say the Lord's Prayer to her, and then we sing Jesus Loves Me. Even when I'm not home to put her down, she will not go to sleep unless someone sings Jesus Loves Me with her. And sometimes throughout the day, she will bust into Jesus loves me. You see, she doesn't need she doesn't need empirical evidence to sing Jesus loves me. 
She doesn't need empirical evidence to know that before she goes to bed, someone is going to say the Lord's Prayer with her. As far as she knows, Jesus is real. And as far as she knows, Jesus loves her because the Bible tells her so. She doesn't need any empirical evidence for that. All she simply needs is for her father to tell her that. My friends, that is the faith of a child. That is the faith of a child. That is the New Testament, my friends. If we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, we will be saved. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not by any works of the law. The simple question that I leave you with today, my friends, is this. Where is the posture of our heart? Is the posture of our heart one that has faith in a loving Father who lovingly is inviting us to be a part of his kingdom, to be a part of his community, who is inviting us to be close to him, who lays his hands on us, and who has blessed us with salvation through his life, death, and praise God, resurrection from the dead, who has blessed us in that no matter what we go through or see in this life, there is a blessing that is waiting for us on the other side. Is our heart postured in faith in that way? Is that our worldview? Are we postured in that way? And does that posture determine the practice of our lives that will determine our eternal product or is our heart postured towards our stuff? Is our heart postured towards working a whole lot so our 401k can get fat and we can retire? Is that our good news? Is our good news pointed towards being as healthy as we possibly can so we can live forever here on this earth? Is our good news pointed and goodness gracious, towards our kids simply? Are we caught up in their activities and what they're doing and making them great? Or are, is the core of our heart posture pointed towards faith in Jesus Christ? His kingdom is filled with people who have the faith of children. great thing about this, and I'll close with this, or I'll preach up here for another hour. The great thing about this is, is that in this sightline series, I looked at the other texts. Goodness gracious, what you learn from these texts in the sightline series, and the beautiful thing about this is that because we have the breath that God formed for us today, we have an opportunity to make a decision. We have an opportunity to say, even if our heart is postured in a direction that's towards our stuff and towards our lives, guess what the good news is? The good news is that the same way Jesus sees those children and the same way Jesus sees that rich young man and the same way that Jesus seen the woman at the well, the same way that Jesus sees Nicodemus, Jesus sees each and every one of us. And that same God who is near them and who is inviting them into the sphere of his love and into the sphere of his grace and into the sphere of his forgiveness is the same God who is inviting us today. The question for us is will we change our posture? If you find yourself with the posture of the rich young man today in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I beg you, change your posture. Change your posture. Because just as Grandpa Glay says, poor posture, son, turns to poor practice. And poor practice will always render poor product. If you will, please pray with me. Jesus, you are king. And that is not a statement that we say lightly. You are our king, Jesus. And Jesus today, 
pray that you would just tune our hearts to see your grace. Jesus, tune our hearts to see your kindness and to see the invitation that is there for each and every one of us, that there is no barriers, that in the same way you invite the children to be in your presence, you invite us. And Jesus, the same way you invite the rich young man out of love to make a decision is the same way you invite us. So Jesus, today, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just pull and tug our hearts, tug our hearts to posture them in faith towards you. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you. We pray these things in your strong name. Amen.